Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening and welcome to this week's um, talk in the lecture series, Ecological Transformations. So we moved online this week and we became multi-sided too. So, so um, the organizing team moved just down the road from the Institute of Geography to the um, Swiss Library of Eastern Europe. Audience joined us from quite some places, um, also different countries. So welcome everyone and welcome, especially Mia Bennett who joined us from Hong Kong, uh, which deserve, deserves much of our appreciation because well, we, we, um, we draw on technology that helps us to manage geographical distances quite effectively in this instance, but um, it's a different story with time differences and um, in Hong Kong, it's already past midnight. So uh, thanks very much Mia for staying awake for this talk and we much appreciate this and looking very much forward to your talk. So um, concerning technology, uh, we would ask the Zoom audience, please to keep yourself unmuted and um, also switch the cams off and to post the question that you have during the talk and after the talk uh, in the chat. And if Amada and I will collect the questions and then um, raise them after Mia's talk or, uh, right. Um, back to multi-sightedness, this may be one of the ways to introduce and circumscribe Mia's um, work and also biography. Um, Mia studied at the University of California in Los Angeles, um, then moved to the University of Cambridge as a Gates scholar and did her master's in um, polar studies, then moved back to UCLA for her PhD and now to the University of Hong Kong uh, where she is an um, assistant professor now. Her regional focus or the regional focus of her research is um, on the one hand, the Arctic and different countries there. So Mia has done extensive research in Canada before, but also in the Russian Federation and, and other Arctic countries. And a second regional focus is uh, our countries and areas uh, within China's Belt and Road Initiative. So he is doing um, research not only on frosty places, but um, also moves further south. south. Field workers brought her to several of these uh, countries and places. She didn't have to visit all of them since she is, um, she draws some very different methods to uh, these include field work and ethnographic methods, but also remote sensing and um, other uh, methods which make her work or are among the things which makes, uh, make her work very original and um, draws, um, allow her to have this vast regional scope. You can um, read a lot about Mia's work in her research articles, but also on her blog, which is cryopolitics, dot com. Um, I already spotted cryopolitics on the first slide of her presentation. So cryopolitics.com is um, Mia's blog and I highly recommend both um, her articles and the blog because Mia is um, not only a brilliant scholar but also has a very um, beautiful and lively uh, writing style, so it's um, both insightful and also pleasant to read her work. So um, Mia, thanks very much for being with us and the virtual floor is yours now. Thank you so much Alex for the opportunity to speak virtually with um, everyone in the audience and online at University of Bern. Um, it's a real pleasure to be part of this series on ecological transformations in Eastern Europe and it's really great to have um, the Arctic kind of able to be included in such a series. So I'm really excited to try and somehow fit in um, my research and make it relevant to, to the audience. So thank you, Alex and Ava, for the invitation. And I do wish, of course, that I could be there 
in person, but uh, yes, so Zoom will have to do. Um, great, so I'll just dive into things. So today I'll be speaking about development on ice. So we'll be looking at kind of, um, of course, how the environment, the cryosphere has shaped a lot of the kind of processes of industrialization, modernization, the construction of infrastructure in the region. But yet I'll also show, I hope to draw out how it's not solely climate change and the environment more broadly construed that are um, shaping the processes of development that are ongoing in this very far flung region. Um, so to start things off in a somewhat historical context, perhaps I'll show this painting, which is maybe known to American audiences of the first train. And it depicts uh, one of the first railroads coming across the United States at the end of the 19th century. Um, so with this train, you have the Transcontinental, Transcontinental Railroad, which is really important to unifying the US and crossing this frontier space. So as the frontier, this kind of Western regions of the US became settled, you had on the one hand, this idea by historian Frederick Jackson Turner, who many of you are probably familiar with, the idea that the frontier has gone, that it's closed, that it's been settled, and that there's no more free land for the taking. Now, all of us know there never really was free land in the first place, and that Native Americans were uh, basically, you know, there were processes of genocide that led them to no longer have their original homes. But in this painting, at least what we can notice is that they're depicted as being kind of passive onlookers at the very least of this infrastructure that's coming across their homeland now, which has become a frontier for development. So one other thread I'll try and draw out today is how actually now Native Americans and indigenous peoples in the Arctic in particular have become actually enrolled in these processes of development and are often leading them themselves. So on the one hand, in the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, we have the closing of the American frontier, if you will. Now, similar processes are also ongoing in other, across other continents around the world. So in Russia, in the 20th century, the Soviet Union um, has a real push to try and industrialize and conquer the Arctic. So across much of the region, you have huge mining projects, oil and gas development starting, the gulag system, cities um, kind of springing up from the western, northwest Arctic to the northeast Arctic in Russia. And this is one place that I visited, um, Mirni City in the Sakha Republic, and you can see just how vast some of these mineral developments were. So on the very edge of the, of the mine there, um, this is a diamond mine, you have a small kind of city that's sitting there. So you have these massive processes of development in the Arctic, which are also starting in a way to change the idea of the Russian Arctic frontier. Um, the Russian Arctic frontier will never be declared to be closed, but I would say as a contrast, it's certainly actually the most developed part of the Arctic overall. So there's just a vast amount of um, natural resource development and a high degree of urbanization for an Arctic region. So all of these processes of frontiers closing, both kind of in the lower latitudes and then in the Arctic as well, have to some degree um, replaced some of the um, traditional practices that you would have. For instance, reindeer herding, right? Of course, many native people still, pra still practice reindeer herding, but it's less common than it used to be. So this is a one caribou herd that does still exist in the Northwest Territories. But this herd, as I'll show later, is kind of now juxtaposed with the with a two-lane highway that crosses the tundra. So as these more traditional practices that had a very small carbon footprint are being kind of replaced, in their stead you have transportation like snow machines crossing these frozen ice roads, which I'll talk about, and which you might have read in one of the pieces that was sent out. Um, so this is a frozen river actually that this uh, snow machine is just driving across in the middle of winter. And leading up towards the Arctic Ocean. So all of these kinds of more industrial transformations are very much employed also by Native people. So you have this further imbrication of Native livelihoods and modern um, technologies as well. To show you a scene of this from the Russian Arctic, um, this was when I was in uh, Mashrutka, so a small kind of uh, minivan, a little bus going for 
a 15 hour journey from Yakutsk to Nyarindri, um, partly on the ice roads and then partly on just this kind of um, highway across the tundra as well. And we have these, you know, carbon intensive modes of transportation that also often end up getting stuck. So I just show you this picture to illustrate that although technology and transportation has become more modern and it does allow us to move across these frontiers and start to develop them more easily, they also run into problems. So this truck got um, basically kind of lost its bearings, I suppose, and ended up blocking all the traffic in both directions. So people instead tried to push the machurka around the side of the truck, which was really quite um, risky because the shoulder basically was non-existent. So they were trying to kind of almost lift it above this soft powdery snow. So there's quite an experience there, but they made it, we survived, and we made it to the degree at around 2 a.m. So that brings me back to my um, bigger question that drives a lot of my research, which is really to understand how and why frontiers are open to development. And so the frontier is such a massive concept in the literature, in geography, um, and in history, uh, all, sorts, all sorts of other disciplines as well. But one thing that I would like to do is try and perhaps push back against more conventional ideas of how frontier development has taken place historically, um, which are usually of the mindset that development in these sparsely populated remote reaches of the world has been imposed from above, top down by the outside. So that's one common explanation. Another is that in these spaces, you have a contest between global actors and local actors. And that these foreign corporations, for instance, are um, basically opposed and challenging whatever kind of local needs there might be. So that's kind of this other dichotomy or binary that exists. And then another would be that, the, that development in frontiers is really environmentally conditioned. So for instance, the kind of linkage from that is that, okay, if we have climate change going on in the Arctic, um, once all the ice is gone, this will open up all sorts of new possibilities for development. Part of that, of course, is true. But what I seek to maybe explain in this alternative reading of frontier development is that we can actually see how development is very much negotiated at multiple scales. So sometimes, as I'll show, local actors will actually mobilize global narratives for their own needs and global actors might do the same. So there, it's much harder to distinguish between who is a global, national, even a local actor now, things are quite mixed up. And also show that development has in no way been along a linear trajectory in frontiers, least of all in the Arctic. We often have political and economic conditions that very much determine whether development even sticks in a place. So I'll try and bring that out through a couple of different vignettes. So, um, I mentioned that I'm going to perhaps be emphasizing the political and economic drivers of frontier development, but nevertheless, I don't want to discount the importance of environmental changes. So of course, we are all deeply and tragically familiar with the way in which the world is warming. And uh, I do think this, this is a really kind of useful illustration or infographic, if you will, by Ed Hawkins at the University of Reading, who shows um, in just this kind of seamless chart here, annual global temperatures with each bar being one year from 1840 to the present. Now, if we look at the Arctic in particular, we see that the Arctic is actually getting hotter much more quickly than the rest of the world. So that suggests that yes, climate change is accelerating. It is even more um, dramatic in the Arctic than in other places. So that is something to pay attention to with regard to why is there suddenly this global interest in developing the Arctic. So as the climate is shifting, what is happening is that these changes, the, the decline in sea ice, the thawing permafrost, the warming temperatures, these climatic changes get mobilized by different political actors for different ends. And so this is a photo I took at the Arctic Circle Conference, which is probably one of the leading conferences on development in the Arctic that only started in 2013. So that again illustrates how recent a lot of this new global interest in developing the Arctic frontier really is. And so I think two narratives that really come out at this conference year after year are on the one hand, 
individuals such as former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who said in his speech to this conference that Arctic melting affects Miami, Mumbai, Shanghai, coastal cities, and so much else. When the Arctic suffers this point of departure, Arctic climate change affects the whole world. And therefore we have an almost kind of eliding between who the Arctic is for and who it's important for and the rest of the world. So there's almost a lack of distinction between, you know, whose region, who, who does the Arctic really belong to? And this also wrapped up in this kind of tragedy of the Arctic, where this idea that it's disappearing due to climate change. On the other hand, the other competing narrative is this one of really intense, exciting development of a new frontier being rediscovered. So if you thought the frontier had closed, well, suddenly sea ice, melting sea ice has made it reopen. And so um, Olaf Ragnar Grimson, who's the former president of Iceland, said in his speech there that the Arctic is like discovering a new Africa. Now, many of you might find this quote actually quite offensive because it repeats and reproduces these notions of white European settlers coming in, exploring a supposed terra nullius, and then basically exploiting it for um, resource development. Nevertheless, this idea, um, I think, does kind of infiltrate a lot of interpretations and narratives of the Arctic, at least in the media and in kind of these policy circles as well, that suddenly there's going to be a resource boom and perhaps also competition and a resource war. And so um, you get these headlines drawing off kind of um, this idea of a discovery of a new frontier that the world has discovered a $1 trillion ocean in Bloomberg, for instance, and that number comes from an estimate of how much investment in infrastructure would be needed in order to adequately develop all of the region's oil and gas and minerals. And so linked up with that, this fits into a wider um, idea that is quite popular now in global development circles that there is a global infrastructure gap that needs to be filled in basically, that there's a, there's a mismatch between how much investment is actually going into infrastructure worldwide and how much we need. And so one of these places where people are really seeking to fill a supposed infrastructure gap is of course the Arctic, right? And so I think this map helps illustrate the kind of facts on the ground that yes, the Arctic is presently less connected to the rest of the world um, than most other parts. So this map is depicting travel time to major cities. So the redder an area is, the longer it takes to get to the nearest city of, I think, 10,000 people. So you can see what we have highlighted are really the Arctic, Siberia as well, um, Central Asia and the Sahara Desert, and then parts of Oceania and Amazon. And often a lot of these places are where we traditionally, uh, what we traditionally associate as frontiers. Um, so you can see how there would be perhaps a linkage to think about, okay, well, these are the actual geographic locations of regional infrastructure gaps that should be filled in. If we kind of change the perspective of the map, and here I'll draw in some of the work I've done using um, remote sensing and nightlight imagery, which is a really um, kind of exciting data set because it allows us to see um, different illuminated places at night from space, from these satellites. And so usually these lights tend to be fairly well correlated with areas of um, human population and human economic activity. Um, so we can look at the Arctic from, uh, the, from the North Pole, from space, and we can see where these different lights are, right? We can see a, a fair amount of light in Russia and in Norway, where these are the more urbanized um, parts of the region with also more resource development, as I mentioned, particularly in Russia, although mostly concentrated in the Northwest. And then Alaska, whose North Slope region has a lot of oil and gas development as well. Um, if we fill out the picture a little bit more, we can start to see this infrastructure gap, right? Like there's basically the Arctic is much darker than the rest of the world because there are fewer people and um, less infrastructure, less lit illuminated um, fixed capital. And so if we were to fill out this whole scene, you can see how the Arctic at the same time could ostensibly provide a shortcut between markets in Asia and Europe via Russia's northern sea route, which hugs 
the northern coast of the country, or potentially, but probably less, um, less easily due to issues with bathymetry and, and navigation, the Northwest Passage through Canada. So from this point of view, we can quickly see, I think, why the Arctic does seem to be an exciting place to perhaps try and again close this frontier and fill in a supposed infrastructure gap. So shifting gears a little bit, I think now it's important to perhaps think about if there's this, this idea that the Arctic is disconnected from the rest of the world and that it needs to be connected in order to push forward development. And we need to then think about well, who are the different actors who have an interest in actually assisting with the development of infrastructure in the region. So one actor I'll first start with is China. Right? So this is the picture from um, the city where I'm speaking from Hong Kong. Clearly it is a massively built up city. I will also say as a caveat that 70% of the city is uh, not built up. It's just beautiful natural environment as well. But we do have this presence of really big skyscrapers, basically. So all of this development um, is kind of a pattern that's being repeated now in mainland China as mainland China catches up and urbanizes and modernizes as well. So I'm kind of putting this out there because I'm going to explain how China is a quite uh, increasingly important player in the Arctic today. Um, so just as this kind of fun fact that some of you might have heard before from sociologist Václav Smil, he calculated that in just a three year period, China used more cement than the US used in the entire 20th century. So you can really see just the kind of massive material transformations that are going into this process of growth within China that is going to have implications for places as far away as the Arctic. So keeping in mind China's growth, again, to kind of illustrate that really phenomenal trajectory, we can look once more to nightlight data. So in this instance, I'll do a comparison between China and the former Soviet Union and Russia. Um, so if we look at this picture of Earth from 1990, 1992, um, we can then carry it forward to 2012. And it's a little bit hard to see the difference here. But what you can do is subtract the 20, the 1992 image from 2012. And what you get is a difference image, which shows in red where lights have increased and in blue where they've decreased. So what we notice is that, of course, mostly in China and India, across Asia for the most part, there's a noticeable brightening um, or increase rather in lights. In contrast, the blue lights are concentrated across much of the former Soviet Union in Russia, in Kazakhstan, in some of the countries in Central Asia. So this suggests that there's a real um, clear political geography to socioeconomic changes and, tra and development trajectories over the past 20 odd years. So this data really nicely syncs up from a kind of an analytical standpoint with the um, disintegration of the Soviet Union in 91. And so um, what this goes to show basically is if you were to add up all of the lights in each country, Russia actually has fewer lights in 2012 than it did in 1992, while China is more than double. And I highlight the Trans-Siberian Railway here because I think that um, a lot of the lights that have dimmed in Russia are often um, juxtaposed with places that were quite important sites of infrastructure development. So once again, we're perhaps seeing um, a real divergence in the trajectories of these two neighboring countries, which will have implications for how partnerships in development under the Belt and Road Initiative, for instance, China's major foreign, develop, foreign policy development initiative um, go forward. And so we can zoom in on this picture a little bit more and look at how closely these differences in changes in lights hue to the Russia-China border. Um, and so you can really just see this is taken from um, along the Amur River, which separates China and Russia here, going around uh, Primorsky Krai. So we have Vladivostok here, which is one of those small, hopeful, increasing lights. But otherwise in Russia, we really just have, uh, a, or in Russian Far East, we really have a sea of blue. So what does this look like in real life? Um, I had the chance after the picture I showed before when I went from Yakutsk to Nyerungri, later on I took the train down to Blagoveshinsk, 
and you can see, um, you know, the waterfront here is not a, a little bit run down. And right across the border is Heihe in China, which has a Ferris wheel and more multi-story buildings. So on the ground, you do have this, again, palpable difference in levels of development. And so I think this, in a way, has led locals that I spoke to, at least, to be somewhat wary of becoming more connected to China because they're perhaps a little bit suspicious of this really quickly growing country that might pose a threat in certain ways. Um, so this mindset, I think, of Russia want, you know, being quite interested in wanting to partner with China in development along the Amur River, I think this also does scale up to the Arctic. And so the Arctic frontier is something that's now of interest far beyond Russia, far beyond Canada. It's, as we've seen, of interest to the rest of the world, um, no, no less than China. And so China has its Belt and Road Initiative, which Alex mentioned in the introduction, which probably you've heard about. It's this $48 trillion plan to build all sorts of transportation across Eurasia and beyond to better connect various markets, um, trade and transportation infrastructure. And so while, ideal, while initially this initiative was meant to recreate the maritime and terrestrial silk roads through Central Asia and the Indian Ocean, we've now seen a big extension of these plans to the point that one route now goes through the Arctic. So this is called the Polar Silk Road. Um, and this is just a map I made to kind of visualize this in a more, um, I guess, captivating way, hopefully than a typical map. Um, but you can see a couple of points I've highlighted here when I'll speak about today is the Yamal LNG project. So Yamal LNG, um, leaving aside the Transpolar Passage for now, Yamal LNG is um, a major project within Russia's newfound desire to redevelop the Arctic and pick up where the Soviets left off so many decades ago now. So Yamal LNG is an operational LNG plant. It's the world's northernmost um, production site for liquefied natural gas and now produces about 5% of the world's gas. Um, Yamal LNG also, I should note, um, does receive a large portion of its investment from China. So China's Arctic policy incorporates development along the Polar Silk Road, and Yamal LNG is really at the heart of that, I would say, for now. And so you can also see this from space. Yamal LNG's development has been quite rapid. Um, we can now see gas flaring occurring in the towns of um, Sabieta, where the port is, and also further to the south. Um, one thing to note about Yamal LNG as well is that the project, I would argue, probably would not have happened without Chinese investment. Um, earlier, there might have been a possibility for other sources of American or European investment. There is some French investment, but largely China was able, after the sanctions, to provide much needed capital to make this project, which was so integral to uh, Vladimir Putin's idea to revive Arctic development, this plan was really integral to that. So we can see how China's various Chinese financial entities have actually really been quite instrumental now in redeveloping the Russian Arctic frontier. And so to now go back in history a little bit, I think what's going to be different with how the kind of forthcoming story of Arctic development in Russia plays out, um, it's important to draw on some lessons here perhaps. So this is a picture of the Kirov's train station. So going, um, if I just go back a little bit to show this map here, Kirovsk is not actually terribly far from Shirkenes, the Norwegian um, city that you see listed here in the map. So Kirovsk is um, probably one or two days north of St. Petersburg by train or car. And in the 1930s, it was also, this small mining town was home to a beautiful train station. Um, so this was built and offered basically, I think, regular connections to St. Petersburg. Um, and this was also mentioned in one of the articles that was sent out as well. So you might be familiar with some of the photos I'm about to show. But what this train station looks like today is radically different. So now the town of Kirovsk is faced with a situation in which the train station no longer offers any sorts of connections to St. Petersburg. Um, there are some trains for the neighboring town that go, but this train station has now fallen into disrepair 
and is covered in graffiti and littered with beer cans. And so I showed this to suggest that at this moment in time where China is coming to many different parts of the former Soviet Union in Central Asia, perhaps in the Russian Far East and we're not, um, and offering these promises of development, I think many of the people on the ground here will be all too familiar with how development actually reversed um, within their own lifespans from these promises and actual materializations and manifestations of really grand development schemes that now basically lie in ruin. So I think it's important for perhaps Chinese actors going in to understand that they may be encountering populations that have very much seen this reversal of development and lived through it. So that's another kind of thread to perhaps think about is how development can reverse. Um, so that's perhaps a more temporal angle to these changes we're seeing on these frontier spaces. But another element that I would like to emphasize is perhaps changes to the scale of the actors involved in development. Um, so we're moving from perhaps a moment in time in the 20th century when the Arctic was very much a frontier for national interventions. You had the Soviet Union trying to conquer its Arctic and develop it. Similar things were going on in the US and in Canada. Now, however, as we've already seen, we have people such as the UN Secretary General getting involved, Chinese actors getting involved. So the Arctic is at once the space for global interventions, as I've shown. This is just a photo from an Arctic conference in, in uh, Shanghai um, last year. So we have these global actors on the one hand. But I think another actor to also draw out, and one that goes back to the first slide I showed of Native Americans then in the late 1800s, passively watching this train um, come through their lands and in this portrayal actually be victims of development. Now I would argue that oftentimes, at least in the North American Arctic, moving to Alaska and Canada, indigenous peoples can very much serve as agents of development um, and very proudly so often. And so I think this next vignette that I'll show perhaps pushes back against a lot of the media coverage of the Arctic um, in which indigenous peoples are really against development, against fossil fuels and mining in their region. I think the story is actually much more complicated and indigenous people like people anywhere hold a diverse array of opinions. Um, and so in my encounters and experiences in the North American Arctic, I have often interviewed and, and worked with people who work for these indigenous corporations. And so I'll be sharing here some of their views and thinking about what kind of development they want on their land. Now that in Alaska and Canada, and unlike in Russia, they often have title to their land. So one big change that's happened in the North American Arctic is that land claims have been agreed between the government and various native peoples. So on the one hand, you have land that now belongs legally to different indigenous groups. And with that, there's also been the rise of various indigenous corporations to manage those lands and manage the funds that were given by the government to these people at the time of settlement. So there's all sorts of really wild um, things I've witnessed in, in kind of working with um, different peoples in the Arctic. So here I was with the um, Ukbyagvik and Yupiat Corporation in the town of um, Ukbyagvik, which is now used to be known as Barrow, Alaska. And so on this day where it was about negative 20, which is considered mild, um, they were blowing up a huge amount of TNT to get gravel out of the tundra so that they could have more, um, the gravel would be used for building pads so that they could put down homes or whatnot in the town. And so, I mean, this was a totally wild experience. We waited outside just to watch the TNT explode. And then it felt like we were basically on the moon. Um, but, you know, this is not really the idea you have of how Native people in the Arctic are interacting with their land, right? You might imagine them going out to hunt or fish, which they very much do still. But there's also these industrial processes as well that are now often driven by Indigenous peoples and Indigenous corporations in particular. So moving across the border from Alaska to Canada, um, this is one case study that I highlight in the um, reading on Midnight Blues in the Melting Arctic should be very appropriate as well since it's now after midnight. Um, but in this piece, which is uh, more for meant for general access and not really too academic, hopefully, so maybe it's a bit 
more um, readable. But um, so in this piece, I'm documenting some of the transitions that I saw going on in the Northwest Territories in Canada, which you see here on the map. Um, so what's really quite um, perhaps a big change in the region is that a few years ago, the first public highway in North America opened to the Arctic Ocean. And so this highway goes all the way to this little town of Tatiatuk, um, and it extends from Inuvik, uh, which is the kind of regional capital. And the, both of these communities lie within the Inuvialuit settlement region. So this is one of those um, many places in the North American Arctic that is a result of the land claims in this instance between the Canadian Crown and the Inuvialuit people. And so this highway extends an existing road called the, oops, called the uh, Dempster Highway, which was built in the 70s. Um, and you can see that that's the kind of edge of this brown highway that goes all the way up from the rest of the North American road network. You might also be notice that there's a road in Alaska that goes all the way north to the Arctic Ocean. Um, that road was also built in the 70s, but you can't drive to the very edge of it because there's the oil and gas installation. So the highway in Canada is the first one where you can go and as they market it, dip your toe in the Arctic Ocean as a regular person. So this road was built, right? It's open. You can drive it now if you want to rent a car and drive all the way from Vancouver to Tuktoyaktuk. It's probably one kind of feasible trip you could still make during a pandemic because you can definitely social distance up here. You might not see another car for days sometimes. Um, and so this, these roads all in brown are kind of known as permanent roads. And what is in orange are these ice roads, which is you know something you see across the Arctic. I mentioned I drove on one or I was in a Mashurka on one in Russia. You also have these that um, in Canada and they provide really important means of getting cargo during the winter when the when the rivers are frozen solid to various settlements and mines um, when otherwise you wouldn't be able to drive because no road has been built. The problem with these ice roads is that as climate change accelerates as we've seen in the Arctic, their seasons get much shorter and it's really hard to condense all the shipping by overland that you might need to do in three months into say one or two months now. So increasingly, there's a tendency to want to replace these ice roads with all weather highways, um, permanent roads. And so when I, before I went up to study this highway between Anubik and Tuck, I kind of had it in my mind that, okay, this is a project that's a climate change adaptation story. And it's another example of the national government intervening in this region that is a kind of classic case of frontier development. Um, and yet, what I noticed is that, you know, some of the reasons I had this idea was because one, the government had done this before with the Dempster Highway. Two, as you see in brown, there's a lot of oil and gas up in the region, so the government might be interested in providing a road to access the oil. And third, we now have the Northwest Passage opening, um, thanks to climate change, a new kind of shipping lane that could allow for, let's say, more cargo shipping between Asia and North America and Europe one day. So yes, okay, replacement of the seasonal ice road, this has happened, right? You see this is how the ice road used to look when the Mackenzie River, River would freeze and you can drive across it. But as I noticed um, over the course of interviews, climate change actually was not really too high on the agenda as a sort of um, real forcer for why a permanent highway was sought. Um, and so this is just a picture here of the hamlet of Tatiyato. You can see how small this hamlet really is. I mean, this is kind of half the town you're seeing. Um, about a thousand people live there. And yet somehow 300 million Canadian dollars were spent on building this winding gravel road across the tundra, as you see here. Um, so this is what it looks like passing by many lakes, which have a lot of importance for local fishing as well. Um, so, you know, in my initial interviews, they again confirmed my idea that the government was just coming in with its plan. You have folks like these civil engineers who have these maps of grand schemes for connecting the whole of northern Canada by road. Um, and with that, you also have individuals such as this Inuvialuit and Gwich'in female uh, woman I spoke to in Inuvik, 
who said the government does what the government does. It pushes its way anywhere and anywhere it wants to. And people don't really have much to say about it. They say we do, but people with the money are the people that do something. The little people that give their comments are not taken into consideration because money talks. So we have this idea that, you know, as we produce here, government is just going to do whatever the heck it wants in these frontier spaces where it's not really being closely monitored. At the same time, what she said is that, okay, well, if money talks, I thought about, well, where's that money actually going to? Where is this $300 million from the Canadian government who is um, getting contracted for the road? So in going further through this research um, and doing further interviews, I ended up speaking with people from the Inuvial Regional Corporation, which manages a lot of the development in the area, thanks to the land claim signed in 1984. And the objective of this agreement um, was partly to have full Inuvial participation in the Northern Canadian economy. So really what we're seeing is a, a desire now, not just by the state to build infrastructure in the frontier, but to have people themselves spearheading development um, themselves. And so a lot of the actors who are receiving contracts to build this road are actually Aboriginal Indigenous owned. Um, so I got to go out on some of these sites. I even drove a rock truck myself and I spoke to people, um, including um, one of the high up people in uh, one of the Nubialot contractors who basically said um, how this road came to be was that the two towns, Nubik and Tuck, rallied and went after the federal government which who agreed to let it go. So we kind of went about it backwards. So they've had a design for 30 years. We wanted to build it. We wanted something to do. They call it the road to resources. So I mean, there's gas fields out there, oil fields. This will just make access much easier. And there's deep sea port as well. There's just so much hook to it. So what I thought, what really struck me is that basically um, this man was so savvy that they could use the government's own narratives and own desires to meet their own agenda, which was to really stimulate local development and get a road to connect their two communities and get a bunch of jobs in for a while. And so I basically would consider this to be some sort of indigenous mobilization of these national discourses of development. And so they were successful in lobbying the federal government for this money and the territorial government as well. They got the money to build the road and they did it. And you can now, as I said, drive it um, any time of year. And so what I think is also quite um, striking perhaps and something that I think merits further research is whether these sorts of development processes would perhaps um, usher in a shift in living off the land. Um, and so, one day I was driving up in a car over to the construction site and one person mentioned, um, who was an environmental monitor for the project in Nubialuit said, the road will ruin my land. And another person who's also um, native in the car said, well, I don't care, I fed my family for five years. So I think this was again, showing the heterogeneity of views in an indigenous community like in any other, where one person is looking kind of more future oriented and thinking about the long-term devastation that this road could bring to his ancestral lands. Whereas the other person felt, well, put food on the table for five years, it gave him a steady job and steady income. So real, I think, differences in temporalities here and thinking about um, land, one's relationship to it, and also what development means. And so I think moving towards the end here, um, just to draw this contrast up again, on the one hand, we have Native peoples in places like the US in the 1800s, looking on passively to these trains marching across their lands. And now in places like Northern Canada, you have indigenous people who are actually building the first highways to places like the Arctic Ocean. So a really striking um, contrast there. Uh, to bring Russia back into the picture, I would say that it's a very different situation. Um, I haven't done any work with indigenous peoples in Russia, but I would know that the situation is, is basically they're much more marginalized, do not have the anywhere near the same sort of land rights that native peoples in North America do. So I'd imagine then you will have a very different set of relationships to the land because they don't necessarily have the ability to 
um, keep the profits from its development and accumulate them. So I think that could be a quite um, interesting comparison to further draw out. So indigenous peoples in the Arctic, North American Arctic can and do leverage various geopolitical and geoeconomic shifts such as the supposed opening of the Arctic to their own advantage for local development. So I think this perhaps suggests that we might want to rethink frontier development, um, especially in this time of climate change, where once again, you have this idea that, okay, all these foreign actors are going to come into this region um, and it's all going to be about global versus local actors and it's all happening due to the melting of the sea ice. Hopefully I've shown a little bit about how development gets negotiated at multiple scales and how it's both um, global and local and politically and economically conditioned. And so a few areas that maybe research could go forward from here would be that frontiers, um, they used to be seen as these places that needed to be settled, right? Or just built up of big cities. But now I think the idea is to fill in these infrastructure gaps and to connect frontiers to global markets rather than bring people to move in. Um, and so that's one shift in frontiers. Um, I think more, much more can be done at how infrastructure development gets negotiated in these kind of MISO scale um, interactions um, and see what projects do happen when kind of local needs happen to either just discursively or in actuality coincide with the visions of greater powers. And then development, of course, is much more than environmentally conditioned and driven. Um, we've seen in the case of the of this former Soviet Union how development very much can reverse and I think more work can be done on kind of people's attitudes to having experienced this coming and going of development and how they might view these grand new plans for development now coming from Beijing. And so just to um, end here on the on a final note, infrastructure gaps are getting closed, more infrastructure is being developed and one of those types of new technologies that continues to be um, advanced by Russia is the icebreaker. And so actually just a week or two ago um, in St. Petersburg shipyard, um, one of Russia's newest and best icebreakers was launched. You can see it's painted in the colors of the tricolor and it's you know supposed to be this um, impressive new development, uh, the height of Russian icebreaking technology. Um, and in the background here, you see a picture of Artika, which was the first uh, icebreaker, the first, um, you know, the first nuclear icebreaker to reach the North Pole only about um, 40 odd years ago. And so on the one hand, yes, okay, all this technology is being built, but keeping in mind that climate change is going forward so rapidly in the Arctic that you might actually, we might actually have an ice-free Arctic within 20 years one has to wonder whether all of this technology will actually become obsolete. So once again, we can now think about infrastructure investment and development happening, but yet it could actually now be rendered um, useless due to environmental changes. So it's important to think about all these environmental, economic and political cycles as very much interrelated and realize that nothing lasts forever. And so, here, I think just to tie this back to the title, um, one thing to note is that we may be leaving the era of geopolitics where, whereby we divide kind of this idea of a, a flat 2D earth into different spaces of territory that belong to different countries and which are bordered in a kind of 2D way. We may be leaving this classical era of how we think about how the earth is divided into a period of much more geological politics in which we're now thinking about um, sovereignty along kind of a more voluminous dimension, right? Where you have not only land, but also geopolitical concerns over the sea column, over the atmosphere, over the various layers of rocks that underlie a country with oil and gas. And we're also at a point where political powers can even influence all these different striations to the geology which brings us to the, the era of the Anthropocene, right? Whereby humans are the largest single geological actor uh, or force um, in the world. So this is just an idea to leave you with if we're now moving from geopolitics or political geography to political geology. 
And I think it's something that is worth considering um, within kind of wider conversations about the Anthropocene and sovereignty and development. So um, I will leave it there and I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Mia, for your talk. Um, this was great. This was fascinating and very rich. Um, I see no question in the chat so far, but uh, I'm sure the people are, are, are formulating it. Um, so I will start with one, maybe of the, on the geographical scope of your argument, um, because you seems to me on the one hand, you described um, multi-layered processes which involve um, uh, environmental change, geological change, infrastructure development, um, variations of um, uh, development, redevelopment schemes and so on. And then you were showing examples from different places around, around the Arctic. And you, you were drawing some parallels between between these places, but I was wondering how you would um, describe the kind of uh, spatial relationality in around Arctic places um, in, in more general terms, maybe. So is, um, do you, what kind of parallels do you see between these places and are they changing at the moment? So is, is a changing Arctic that you describe so a process that drives um, new connections across countries? Um, and if so, at which levels? And, and I'd be curious to learn if you see any new evolving parallels, say, between Canada and, and Russia, for instance, or other countries evolving in this uh, process. Yeah, thanks for your question, Alex. Um, let's see, where to begin? Because it is a big question. but. Um... I think maybe one thing that I could probably emphasize more is that even within the Arctic, right, I'm using this regional term or name, but even within the Arctic, there's so much difference between a place like um, Tromsø in Northern Norway um, versus even a town like um, Inuvik and then Tsatsiatsuk, and then you could go to a small Russian town. So. Some places you can get, like in Northern Norway in a city, you could probably get any kind of grocery item you wanted, have really rapid internet, so on and so forth. Whereas in a small town in the Canadian or Russian Arctic, you could have very few kind of imported goods, maybe not a very good internet connection and be much more remote. So I think the Arctic itself, first of all, has a lot of um, heterogeneity within it um, in terms of levels of development. Now, in terms of parallels you could draw across the Arctic. In Canada and Russia, um, as I mentioned, I think the, the kind of futures for Indigenous peoples are very different at the moment. I think they are much more empowered in Canada and also in Alaska. And in Russia, I don't think the situation is particularly hopeful in terms of allowing Indigenous peoples to maybe benefit from industrial development. But at the same time, I don't, I mean, you can make the argument that because they're not necessarily profiting from development, they might be more likely to continue practicing um, traditional ways. Um, but that's a really tricky argument to make. And I mean, even in Alaska and in Canada, people like they'll spend their day job working on a computer and a, driving a truck and then on the weekends, they'll still practice fishing or subsistence things. So it's a very complex kind of issue in terms of the parallels. Um, one last point maybe to make is that I do think in both Canada and Russia, there's an increasing tendency to try and rely on fly in, fly out labor. Um, I think this has been written a lot about in both countries from anthropological standpoint but you no longer in either instance really have the governments trying to move huge amounts of people into either Northern space. And instead, both countries, the government still have a drive to develop Northern resources, but using a mobile labor population that requires, that doesn't require um, having to build these really 
resource intensive settlements anymore. And that comes with its own implications for um, keeping, you know, the revenues of development within a community, but um, I won't go down that path for the moment, but hopefully that answers some of your question a little bit. Yeah, if I can just uh, follow up on that, because I was also really intrigued about this point. You pointed out rightly that that um, the legal situation is very different because the indigenous people in Russia do not have a special uh, special status or special rights on the land, even though I think at least in Yakutia and with the Evang people there are actually some local strongmen indigenous of indigenous uh, descent who have quite important po positions of power but more sort of in the in the tra traditional russian oligarch style i would say <laughs> to put it uh, put it a bit bluntly but what i find interesting also is maybe you could say a bit more about growing and shrinking populations in the arctic because as you've shown also with the light map in in arctic russia you've had a, a really a strong decrease you have like a reverse development a lot of settlements have been giving up also from what i know in in soviet times there had been a, a strong population transfer from russian uh, pop, russian descent population to indigenous areas and that has partly reversed at least i know from kamchatka and other regions so it's actually like a re-indigenization of the region if you want yeah so how um how has this this happened are they where are the centers of growth i would say in in these arctic regions and do the new arctic sea routes really change also like the the population distribution along these arctic regions that would be something that interests me yeah those are terrific questions um in terms first of all of demographic changes in the arctic um i think that you bring up a really good point of this re-indigenization, especially in Russia. Um, and that was something I noticed in Yakutia is now people say that um, if you don't speak um, Yakut, you're at a big disadvantage for getting work. Whereas maybe a few decades ago, you know, it would have been reverse, right? A kind of ethnic Russian might have had a, a more of a privilege in, in, um, in the economy. And so that's a really fascinating change. And in, uh, in Canada and Alaska, I think as well, and I would say also in Greenland, I think indigenous identity and being able to speak a language is actually a really kind of point of pride now and something that is valued, um, but not a lot of it has been lost in some of these communities now. Um, in terms of population shifts, I think, I don't know about the numbers overall in Russia. I think I think probably a lot of these towns are still shrinking and I don't think the sea routes will change it. But as you mentioned, the people leaving are often ethnic Russians, right? Whereas indigenous um, people, ethnic minorities, they will um, tend to stay. So it, the numbers might still not look very rosy, but the composition will be quite different. In Alaska and Canada, a lot, of, I mean, a lot of young people still want to out migrate. And that's actually a really big problem in Greenland where so many of these villages are now at risk of becoming permanently closed basically because people want to live in the capital. And then if they move from the village to the capital and nuke, then the next step would be to Copenhagen. So out migration continues to be a big problem. And that's another, pro another challenge for if resources get developed and they just rely on fly and fly out labor across the Arctic, then there aren't even resource jobs for the people who stay. So trying to think of a way to attract young people to stay is quite challenging. Um, and I'm not really sure of the best way forward for that. But um, I would say the one place maybe where population is quite steady and where you get people moving in is maybe in Scandinavia um, with tourism actually drawing so many people, more so than shipping. I think tourism will drink Will bring a lot of um, like seasonal labor. I think in Northern Norway, I met people from like Lithuania and Poland and whatnot who are all coming to work in these places where they could make a lot of money in a few months. Yeah, that's actually another point I wanted to ask about because um, there's 
two more traditional, at least from coming from Russia, there's one more traditional use of the Arctic, and that's the place of the Arctic as a, a place of banishment, or, you know, the penitentiary or the gulag and so on. But the other new, new sort of a way of looking at the Arctic is as a increasingly, as I understand it, also as a place of tourism. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's been historically also a very remote place, also maybe sort of exclusive, but I think with climate change, it also becomes, I think, more accessible or maybe more accessible. Maybe you can say something about this and how this changes also the the regions that are visited. Yeah, I think tourism is a huge um, factor that's affected the Arctic up until, you know, the pandemic. And I would say it's really been noticeable in the past five years. Um, for instance, I went to Iceland in 2011, and uh, well, actually, so I was flying there from New York just to go on like a camping trip. And then there were um, some of my coworkers were also on the flight randomly, and they were like, "Why are you going to Iceland?" Because they were just doing the stopover flight to get to Paris or London or somewhere. But then a few years later, like they're going to Iceland as much as they can on the weekend from New York. So everyone wants to go to this region not only is it becoming more accessible for cruise ships, but I think related to climate change, there's an idea that it's this last chance tourism um, so that they want to see the icebergs before it's too late. Right? So there's all these kind of push and pull factors bringing people in. Um, and Chinese people actually are, uh, Asian tourists are a big source of the new tourism flows, particularly in Russia. Um, and so in Russia, I think the Russian Arctic offers uh, cheaper and sometimes easier in terms of the visa Arctic tourism option for Chinese tourists compared to Northern Norway or Finland. So you'll have busloads of Chinese tourists going to um, Murmansk and then they go to this village of uh, Tiribeka on the, that was in the movie Leviathan. Um, and so I think that town is, from what I've heard from colleagues who have done research there, just they're kind of sick of tourism. <laughs> It's brought a lot of money quickly. Um, and so I think tourism is a huge, bringing lots of changes to the region that are worth scrutinizing further. And I'm sure, you know, once hopefully this pandemic ends, I think the, the trends will come back where people want to go to the Arctic still. Mm -hmm. There's a, a question in the chat. I'll just read it to you, um, a more basic question. Are there notable groups interested in inhibiting the Arctic development? What are their motivations? I would assume environmental protection. Yeah, thanks, Florence. That's a great question. Um, yes, yeah, so I would say the main groups tend to be, from the outside, do tend to be these environmental groups. Um, and then, of course, you have locals who sometimes are opposed to development too. But what was really interesting was that time and again, in my interviews with um, people in Alaska in particular, they have this real animosity towards Greenpeace, um, uh, wilderness society, these, these types of NGOs that they feel come in and tell them what they can and cannot do on their own lands. So there's a real um, tension and a feeling that often um, the environmentalists coming don't spend a lot of time in the Arctic there are people who are white people, non-native, who live in San Francisco or Seattle or something and have no sense of what is needed in these communities. So there's uh, yeah, a lot of um, tension. I think the environmental groups now recognize that they can't just go and say, we want to preserve the whole Arctic anymore. They need to be much more nuanced and not um, you know, banish people from their, own, from their own lands in order to safeguard it. So I think both sides are hopefully gaining a little bit more recognition of the complexity and the different stakeholders involved, but definitely environmental groups are the big one. And then there are different, you know, sometimes national governments also want to conserve it um, now that people have more of this environmental mindset, like the Obama administration and the Trudeau administration jointly signed a moratorium to prohibit um, offshore oil and gas development which was reversed by the Trump administration, but so governments too can sometimes be um, opposed to development. And that's been the battle playing out in the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge for, for decades now. So there's lots of different actors, but it's, it's a good question. 
Yeah, we have another uh, question from the chat. Um, I was wondering how much or to what extent the Arctic Silk Road could affect the Arctic Circle economically, environmentally, socially, etc. Maybe you could say a bit more about the Silk Road and its impacts, advantages and drawbacks. Right. Um, let's see. So Arctic Silk Road. Um, so I think, first of all, economically, um, that's probably where we'd see the first impacts. Um, when I was describing the Yamal LNG plant, I think that would technically could be considered part of the Silk Road because it is Chinese capital going into developer projects along the Northern Sea Road, which now so often gets called Polar Silk Road. So you'll have more Chinese capital coming into the region. Um, that could also maybe happen in Greenland. Um, I think one reason that the Trump administration has Greenland on its radar more now is because there is behind the scenes a worry about China um, providing some sort of competition against the US and some, some form of great power composition that the US wants to try and um, block off. Right? The US still has an air base in Greenland and does not want, for instance, as was proposed, China constructing commercial airports in Greenland. So Greenland is maybe the more um, Western end of the Silk Road, but everywhere in between, as with all of these issues, it's quite a complex picture. So I think um, like in Norway, a few years ago, or actually just last year, I went to this festival in Shirkanes where I showed on the map of the Polar Silk Road and Shirkanes, they held an arts festival. They hold an arts festival every year. And um, last year, the theme was the world's northernmost Chinatown, which is like really a crazy theme to choose. Um, but they built a little Chinatown gate in their small Norwegian town, which is right on the Russian border. And you could get like hot noodles and listen to Chinese sci-fi authors talk that they'd invited. And in talking to the organizer of this festival, um, they said like they were just so excited about all the Chinese tourists coming, this interest in the Silk Road, this new kind of Asian presence that they wanted to kind of like do something reciprocal. Um, so I thought that was just quite unusual that there's this new almost cultural mixing or social mixing of East and West in the North. So I think that's kind of a very like anecdotal example of one event in one town. But socially, you could have very unusual changes. Um, someone also mentioned to me that in Greenland now, in some of these tiny towns, you have Chinese laborers working in the fish processing plants. So on some of the radio stations, it's just um, Mandarin now, which is like very unusual to think about this happening in Greenland. Um, and then because there's no Greenlandic in Google Translate, then the Chinese speakers have to do Chinese to Danish and Google Translate to communicate with the Greenlander people who can speak Danish. So very odd social interactions, I would say. Um, and then environmentally, I think one um, area that I'm quite interested in and probably would have to collaborate more with others to under fully understand is just the impacts that China as the one of the world's largest you know, greenhouse gas emitters has on the Arctic from a distance, right? Um, a lot of black carbon in the Arctic can be traced to East Asia. Um, and then, so China has a, is accelerating climate change from afar. And also if it pursues development of the polar Silk Road, certainly that's going to have many more localized effects from in, um, increased shipping, increased port development in the region. And given that China does not have the strongest record when it comes to environmental performance, I do think that's something to um, scrutinize as China does, you know, it might have a, a positive intentions, but the record or not is not always very good with how it's done environmental um, impact mitigation, for instance. So I think that will need to be considered in its role in the Arctic. I find this really fascinating that with all this change in the Arctic region, suddenly one of the strongest players is China. My follow-up question would be whether especially climate change or also development of new infrastructures has led to closer cooperation between the Arctic states, between the Arctic border states, border regions. So also maybe the new seas ways, you know, if, if that, if you see a change there happening. 
Yeah, I think there definitely is a lot more cooperation than there used to be. Um, but I don't necessarily, I mean, climate change certainly plays a role, but I think a lot of it can actually be traced to the end of the, um, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in the early 90s, um, there was a feeling that, okay, now that the Arctic, I think um, Gorbachev gave a speech in the late 80s saying, let the Arctic be a zone of peace. And so there was, a, I think, a desire within the um, eight Arctic states to move away from militarizing the region. And so they began cooperating first on environmental issues, which are, you know, often the kind of easy ones for countries to work on and, and not too um, controversial. But gradually this environmental cooperation to preserve flora and fauna in the region that got scaled up into the Arctic Council, which is now the leading um, intergovernmental organization for the eight countries with territory north of the Arctic Circle. And so through that organization, a number of different agreements have been signed in the past decade or so between Arctic countries on everything ranging from oil and gas spill preparedness to science cooperation to um, now uh, moratorium on fishing, which actually was also signed by China, Japan, and Korea. So you have more and more cooperation between Arctic states. Um, the Arctic region has also been a really important channel for maintaining cooperation between the West and Russia at a time when it's so challenged in other um, dimensions. But it's also been a new um, channel for cooperation between Asia and the West, I would say. Um, although that's been a bit tense at times when China is involved. But yeah, so I think overall, there's a lot more cooperation, but much more could be done. Like even between Alaska and Canada, there's still very few linkages. Like if you wanted to fly from the town I showed in northern Alaska, which is maybe a, a half hour flight to um, northern the northern Canadian town, you would actually have to go, I think, through Seattle or Vancouver. So it can be really tricky. Uh, but then, like the the local people, just get in their snow machine and go. So yeah, it sounds really. Um... Uh, like a really interesting just just example of, of how national borders still top you know local yeah. conditions in many times yes. i was just wondering um coming coming back to something you wrote and also talked about about how now new infrastructures are built because we see this region as a region of development but then the whole scenery is changing so fast that it's not really clear whether these infrastructures will be holding on for more, for longer or even as long as the last infrastructures did. And when we look at the, I don't know if you've seen the flyer we did for this lecture series, which mm -hmm. uh, and the, the cover image is an image of the diesel oil spill in the river Taimir, uh, which happened in, in May, June um, this year, uh, when uh, Norilsk nickel plant uh, had an accident. Which is also, as I understand it, linked or caused by, or this is the official explanation of the thawing of the permafrost, which made the whole um, fuel tank unstable. So there is a lot, of, uh, a lot of ways in which uh, changing climate um, conditions in the Arctic also have environmental um, follow up follows. Um, and I was wondering whether, in cases like this, you know, bilateral or multilateral cooperation in the Arctic is now something that would go over the Arctic Council, whether this is facilitated, if we compare it to earlier on, whether there's really been an, you know, a better cooperation in, in working also with environmental issues that come up now. Yeah, that's a really important case you mentioned, um, a massive tragedy too. I think it's the largest oil spill to occur in the Arctic and um, maybe ever. Um, but yeah, so huge amounts of oil spilled outside Nordisk. And I think the issue though is that yes, okay, there's a lot more cooperation in the Arctic on kind of problems of collective action. So oil spills in the Arctic Ocean or climate change. But if an emergency or disaster happens within a country's borders, I think it will still tend to try and handle it itself. And in the case of Russia, I don't really know if they're going to be welcoming all the international observers and NGOs to go suss out what really happened. 
Um, and I mean, the same would probably be true of, of other countries in Arctic too, right? If it's a national issue, they try and solve it themselves first. Um, but nevertheless, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, that, that, that issue is just, it's hard to say if there could be perhaps more potential for maybe knowledge exchange, like if a spill happened in one country, could they lend their expertise to how they handled it to another country? I don't know if there's really a lot of room or appetite for that yet, but that would be a good thing to try and encourage. Um, but I'm not sure. I think I could see it happening within, say, Scandinavia or North America, but I don't know if there will be a lot of change, exchange of expertise between Russia and the other countries in that regard. Yes, any more questions? Don't be shy. R write in the chat. We can also so translate it if you just want to write in German because it's easier and faster. Um, I'd have another one on the on um, profit sharing in the northern territories of Russia. Um, since if you look at the list of the most wealthy regions of the Russian Federation today, you see many of the northern regions actually coming up and then it may seem a bit misleading because quite some of them have uh, the uh, titles of the indigenous groups living there as, as the official um, names, titles of, of this region. Um, so you, you were mentioning some of the uh, some points related to the labor questions and labor relations with incoming and outcoming la labor for um, resource extraction. But can you, um, maybe also because I think the question of indigenous people in the in the Russian far north is maybe not uh, one that, that everyone is familiar with, a uh, bit of a overview of the um, role of indigenous groups in these regions, um, the benefit or, or profit sharing between different groups and um, maybe a parallel to what you described in for Canada, the involvement of indigenous groups in, in the large economic projects there. Yeah, so I don't know how much I can comment on the role of indigenous groups in, for instance, kind of profit sharing in Northeast Russia. I don't have much expertise in that area. Um, but I think you, you're very right in mentioning that, for instance, a thing like Chukotka is one of the wealthiest regions in terms of kind of maybe per capita GDP from all of the gold mines. But one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these revenues are not necessarily going to be kept by um, the people living in these resource rich, sparsely populated, largely indigenous parts of Russia. Um, that being said, I have heard from colleagues who've been in Chukotka that they do really um, love Abramovich and he's given like cash handouts to people. So, I mean, maybe some oligarchs can fill the gap that, you know, is left by these institutional voids and in which grant indigenous and native people very few rights to their land. Um, but that's not really, I think, the structural way to go about improving kind of developmental outcomes for Native people. Um, in other instances, like I don't, you know, what's interesting in Alaska is that maybe you're familiar with the fact that Shell was trying to drill for oil offshore until 2015, and then they decided they were going to give up. Um, but the company that bought their leases was actually a Native-owned company, and now they were trying to do it themselves. I don't think you would ever encounter a similar story in the Russian Arctic, um, but you will have native people employed in some of these projects, like in the um, Yamal Peninsula and a lot of the natural gas installations, there will be native people, the Ninets people who will go work for two weeks and then go back to reindeer herding for two weeks. So there's kind of a, like a hybrid economy in different parts, um, but that'd be more in, I think, Ninets region. And then in other, other parts of the Russian Arctic, I mean, you have the whole history of their basically forced collectivization of reindeer herding, um, of fishing and things like that. So I think there's a much more um, 
on the one hand, kind of a resentment of this kind of forced industrialization. It wasn't something that was more bottom up as you're seeing in North America. And so there's a lot of legacies of that. Um, that I'm not really a person to necessarily be able to comment too much on, but um, I don't know if, if Eva or other people in the audience might have more to share in that regard. There's another question in the chat, which I'll read to you. I have a question about China's Belt and Road Project, especially the new Arctic trade route. I'm not uh, too sure about that, but I heard that neither countries, companies, nor any other actor is allowed to claim or control international sea trade routes. So my, my question is first, if that is true, and if so, isn't China kind of breaking this rule and builds up sort of a trade monopoly? Great, yeah, so Till, thanks for your question. I would say that yes, it is true that, so there's the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and that has been signed by almost every country in the world except the US, which has to be the special one, but um, they basically still abide by it on close, they just don't want to ratify it. But so within this convention that nearly every country agrees to, the international seas are the high seas and every signatory has the right to freedom of navigation. Um, so nobody controls the high seas. It's basically, um, you know, just anyone can sail through them. Now the issue is with Arctic shipping in particular is what actually counts as an international shipping lane. So Russia claims that its Northern Sea Route is internal waters. Um, the US and China, this is actually one area where they agree with each other, they would claim that the Northern Sea Route is actually international waters so that they should be able to sail through. Now, they've never really challenged this. So if a, I don't think it's happened, but if a US ship were to sail through the Northern Sea Route, they probably would pay the escort fee that Russia, that the Russian government demands. But I think like in principle, the US and China being major trading nations would want to promote as open seas as possible and not have areas classified as internal waters or claimed as such. So there's differences in interpretation of different parts of the ocean. But if everyone agrees that it's an international high seas, then yes, freedom of navigation applies. So your second question is China breaking this rule. I don't think China is actually breaking any rule because it's not really building up a, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I guess what you mean by building up a trade monopoly, um, but they are, yes, they are increasing their capabilities in Arctic shipping. They are building ice class ships and can assist with more cargo transportation in the region. But I think they still do all of that within the boundaries of the, within, within the kind of bounds of the of Unclosed Treaty. Um, and so if anything, I think it's all, by the book and legal, but if anything, maybe a country could feel threatened that China is becoming more a more capable Arctic maritime nation, but I don't see anything um, law breaking in this regard. What maybe could be, it wouldn't be law breaking to unclose, but if China decided to act on its view that the Northern Sea Road is international waters and just sail through without notifying Russia, and without paying the escort fee, that could be, that would be very dramatic, but I don't think China would actually do that. Um, that would be very like, yeah, dramatic action to take, so. Okay. Okay, so there's another question in the chat. As a Chinese student, I know that the Chinese government put forward a white paper on the Arctic Belt and Road Initiative in 18 years. But I really want to know that as the two countries closest to the Arctic, the most important experience of the Arctic route, will the relevant laws on navigation proposed by Russia and Canada in this process affect the Arctic route? I know that they have made relevant requirements for restriction navigations in icebound areas. At the same time, I am curious about what problems you think China has in the Arctic trade routes that need to be improved. Okay, um, thank you, Hulkman. I would say, okay, first of all, right, so I think your question draws on a lot of the kind of perhaps topics I was 
I was touching upon here where you're very right in that Russia and Canada have their own laws for navigation in their North, Northern Sea Route for Russia and Northwest Passage for Canada. So whereas the US and China, as I mentioned, view those routes as international waters, Russia and Canada each view their own respective Arctic waters as internal shipping routes that they therefore have jurisdiction over in accordance with UNCLOS, because UNCLOS says, if this is your internal water, you can um, create some regulations. If it's international seas, you can't. That's a, kind of a simplification, but that's basically the difference. So Russia and Canada, I think their laws on navigation will, on paper, only affect the areas that they claim as internal waters. But you could see, perhaps, let me think about this. Especially, I mean, Russia actually has a much more developed kind of Arctic maritime system than Canada. And because of that, maybe Russia, with its history of Arctic maritime navigation, icebreaker escorts, could perhaps sell its services to other shipping companies that might want to sail outside of Russian Arctic waters, but rely on its expertise somehow or icebreaker services. Um, for instance, if you wanted to sail to the North Pole as a tourist, I think the only way you can still do it is on a Russian nuclear icebreaker. So Russia is still by far the most capable actor in the Arctic maritime space, but I think its laws, as with Canada, still would only apply for now in their Arctic waters. Um, one kind of side note to that, though, is uh, I was at the International Maritime Organization in February for their meetings on um, whether to, so basically there's a polar code that governs Arctic shipping and that polar, uh, Arctic and Antarctic shipping. And so in Antarctica, ships are not allowed to burn heavy fuel oil, which is a very polluting kind of heavy diesel. And so the debate is whether to extend this ban on heavy fuel in Antarctica to the Arctic. There's been a lot of hesitation, especially by Russia, because the Arctic is so important economically to them that to have to use a cleaner fuel would be very expensive. So they've been delaying it. What was really interesting at the meetings, though, is that you could really suddenly see almost this geopolitical division of countries whereby um, so Canada, US, basically every Arctic country except Russia was in favor of, um, of extending the ban on heavy fuel oil to the Arctic, but Russia did not want to. And then China and Saudi Arabia also supported Russia. Um, so I thought that was really kind of a fascinating uh, division, if you will, in terms of views of you know this very small regulation in the Arctic shipping, but um, it still had geopolitical kind of divisions through it. Um, and then your other question, yeah, okay, so you also, yes, they have made, they have restricted navigation in icebound areas, so it seems like you know about uh, Article 234, which I won't, like, bore everyone else with, but basically there's one small provision in UNCLOS that allows these countries to make even more regulations if the waters within their maritime domains have ice in them. Right, so what's really fascinating about that provision is that as climate change proceeds, the legal basis for making requirements might disappear. So that'll be interesting to see how um, climate change and the legal, legal rules interact going forward. With regard to um, what China, what problems China has in Arctic trade routes that need to be improved, um, maybe could you clarify, is this, a problem that China is causing or encountering in the Arctic, in Arctic trade routes? I could, I could also try and answer both ways. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll start by problems that China could help with, because um, I think China often gets painted as this, you know, you know, malintended actor. 
But I do think that China often is approaching issues in the Arctic with kind of um, without always having ulterior motives. And one area where China could perhaps provide assistance is in building a lot of infrastructure simply in the Arctic. Um, the country has rapidly advanced its steel manufacturing to the point that it's one of the few countries that can now manufacture ice class ships. Um, we've seen already years ago, China built a railway across permafrost to Tibet. And so that kind of technology could be used in other parts of the Arctic, for instance, between Norway and Finland, there's a um, plan to build an Arctic railway. Um, so that technology could come out of China now to be used in Arctic development. Now saying all of that, at the same time, people could be skeptical that so much development should even occur in the Arctic because you might be more environmentally um, minded. And so those are maybe where someone else could interpret China's ability and desire to build all this infrastructure in the Arctic as a problem because you might view, well, actually China should try and encourage more environmental and sustainable development rather than contributing to more oil and gas development in the region. Um, so I think China's activities in the Arctic could be interpreted either way. Um, other problems with China and the Arctic, perhaps, uh, you could, I could foresee issues with fishing going forward because China is such a major seafood consumer. And then this year, if you were seeing the news, if there were these Chinese trawlers outside the Galapagos and these Chinese trawling fleets often will come and um, just vacuum up the ocean. I mean, other countries do this too, like Spain, but China will get the worst wrath, of course. Um, now, China and many other countries have signed on to the moratorium to prohibit commercial fishing in the Arctic Ocean for the next, from now 15 years. Um, after that point, it will, it's unclear if that, con if that agreement will be renewed. And so if China were suddenly to start going like fishing in the middle of the Central Arctic Ocean once it's ice free, that probably wouldn't go over very well. So I think that should be considered. Um, yeah, I would say those are some issues. I think maybe the last one is China often has a lot of capital and even good intentions in its development, but it doesn't always have the kind of cultural knowledge from having people live and interact with communities for a while. So I would say anywhere that China is going to carry out foreign development, ensuring it has that um, cultural expertise and understanding of how to form good relationships with local communities is very key to a successful development project. Um, so maybe that's some, some thoughts on that. Thank you so much, Mia. We're already, I think, nearing the end of our evening. Um, I did have like one last, maybe it's not even a full question, but a little remark, your icebreaker images I found the, of the Soviet icebreakers and the Russian icebreaker today really um, made it clear how, how also symbolically important this uh, development of this uh, Arctic frontier has been for the Soviet Union. I mean, that the first big icebreaker, icebreaker passage was in the 1930s in full Stalinism is really an, also a propaganda coup and um, was covered all over. And I think uh, maybe you could just say a few words on how this symbolic dimension of, of you know, this is this is our frontier, this is something in our tradition that we have conquered. So, so sort of a Soviet legacy also, something that one wants to continue and how this symbolic dimension of the Russian conquest of the Arctic is maybe still playing out. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's great to be able to tie the Soviet conquest to the Russian reconquest, if you will. Um, and I do think that the desire by Putin and the Kremlin to develop the Arctic is not purely a commercial and economic one. I mean, yes, there is an economic necessity to develop more northern oil fields as the ones in Western Siberia dry up. But as you mentioned, uh, there is this also symbolic importance of the Arctic to Russian identity, to Russian nationhood. And so one interesting thing with like the Yamal project, for instance, um, so even though it was funded 
in no small part by Chinese and also French capital, the way it got portrayed in the Russian media was that this was a huge moment demonstrating how Russia is back in the Arctic. And you had um, Putin attending the opening ceremony in Sovieta where he pressed the button that made the delivery of the first gas to the tanker offshore. So it was presented this very proud moment um, for Russia. Um, and yet, if you look at how this same event was represented in Chinese media and China saying, oh, this is the, Yamal is the pearl of the polar silk road. And it's a, almost a point of pride for China to be involved in this momentous occasion. So I think now maybe the difference is that even countries without territory in the Arctic are starting to try and build these Arctic legacies of development for some sort of national symbolic pride. Yeah, it's um, a great example of how one installation can have two symbolic meanings. Exactly. Yeah, and then the fact that Russia is still rolling out new icebreakers is, I mean, testament to how important being capable in the Arctic is. Meanwhile, the U.S. hasn't built a new icebreaker since I think the 70s or 80s. Um, so yes, definitely very important for Russia uh, and for the current administration there too. Yeah, one last question from the chat before I think we'll close the chat and then slowly fade out here. Okay. Um, do you think these current infrastructure developments are sustainable mid to long term? Or is it more of a get what we can now and then leave considering the effects of climate change? Okay, yeah, great question, Nicholas. Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that. I mean, this the cynic in me would probably say yes, people are just trying to make their money while they can and then yeah, get out. Um, some, some of the contractors I've spoken to on these projects, they almost like laughingly say, well, we did the assessment for 30 years, the climate assessment, I don't know what'll happen after that, but whatever. And so there's like this real lack of foresight and thinking about the sustainability of these developments. Um, I, I would hope that there's a longer term view to building infrastructure, but I, I don't know. I think everything happens so piecemeal and then there isn't a sort of region wide integration plan or anything. Um, and the Arctic, like the history of Arctic development is so much colored by this boom and bust cycle of going in for resources and coming out and then going back in when another commodity gets all exciting and then leaving again. And so I'm not convinced that now people are suddenly going to start investing in things more sustainably. And I think, you know, this is probably a tendency that happens worldwide where humans just want to go and strike it rich and then they'll leave. But the problem that I see is the consequence, which I think is worse in the Arctic, is the fact that there is very little enforcement or monitoring to at least even make people clean up after themselves when they leave. An example that I maybe will close on is that in the town of Tatiyakta, so there was a lot of oil and gas development in the 80s when Arctic oil actually was having a moment. And um, suddenly the, the price of oil dropped and companies pulled out but they left all their rigs behind, um, you know, the land was polluted and it was much easier for them to just pay any fines than to do a proper cleanup. And so what you have now is this oil rig floating offshore, this community will sail out to it and play on it in some sort of kind of very dystopian scene that this huge oil rig is effectively a playground, um, which is probably toxic, but you know, so I think that's probably even one of the more negative impacts of development in the Arctic. Is that like anywhere people are going to leave once they made their profit? But is anyone going to keep them to task about what to do after that? Uh, I don't really see that happening. But I, uh, the, the more hopeful side of me will say maybe, maybe something will change this time if more people like you get um, involved in, yeah, ensuring a more sustainable future, hopefully. So we'll end on a positive note. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mia, for the positive ending, for the very rich and inspiring uh, multifaceted 
talk and, and discussion. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's 2 a.m. Hong Kong time now <laughs> already, <laughs> almost. Um, thanks for staying with us. Uh, we, we much appreciate this um, and appreciate our contribution. So the applause in the virtual format is different than the <laughs> than with the live audience, but I think, yeah, right, so this, um, yeah, no, this deserves a huge applause. So, so thanks, thanks so much for this. Um, we will continue the lecture series in two weeks. Uh, in if, if COVID permits, um, on the spot again with Christina Bixel talking on um, waste of space travel in Kazakhstan. So we are looking forward to. Uh, this presentation too. Looking forward to welcoming all of you in two weeks. And yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Goodbye. Have a good evening. Yeah, excellent questions and very stimulating conversations. So have a good evening in Switzerland and elsewhere. Bye. Bye bye.